Why, why do I not get the same way you do? Get what? The echo. <laughs> I, think, um, I think the microphone can tell that he's got a more devilish soul than I do. <laughs> Mine's more present. A dildo <laughs> it's not a dildo, it's a that microphone. A dildo. Anything can be a dildo, really. Anything can be a dildo, people. I remember when I was a child, actually, I was told that um, <laughs> anything can be a dildo. I was, I was in a sex shop, um, and my mother actually worked there. And she said, oh, yes, like anything, anything can be a dildo. Anything that can give you oral, anal, penile, or vaginal stimulation can be a dildo. That's true. Um, I, um, so I look at the world as a dildo now. My mother used to always say, like, we didn't have dildos when we were young. Yeah. We had to use anything. Yeah. My dad would be like, I mean, I'd be sitting on, you know those spikes on windowsills sometimes? My dad would be like, I'd have to sit on them waiting for the bus just for a bit of pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. Yeah. He did, he didn't. Rubbing your butt on a wall. Sometimes that's good. You can get a bit of a, a raw butt. A raw buttock. <laughs> anyway, the next um, speaker. The next dildo up. The next dildo up is, um, is Richard Howard. Uh, and he's uh, he's a um, a long time um, contributor to the zine. Yeah. And um, for me, Richard is actually the anti dildo because yeah. Colin has a story about Richard. He was. We were on a beautiful holiday one time as pals, and he was methodically rubbing his girlfriend in the room next to mine. <laughs> and I could hear him through the wall as I was, you know, I was trying to masturbate against the pillow. <laughs> uh, it wasn't pleasurable, so I had to stop. So this is why I see Richard as the anti dildo. <laughs> A N T E. An ante yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, please give a warm welcome to Richard Hard. Warmly received him. <laughs> Colin Whelan's Oedipal fixation on me continues. <laughs> um, okay, I was going to read a story that was 4,000 words long because it was the only story I had that had any sex in it but um, it was too long and it was only four sentences that were to do with sex and it was it was a premature ejaculation after 3,500 words so I decided not to not to read that one um, so this is well, when the call for paper, the call for our submissions went out for this, it said it was sex and relationships. So I decided to just read any old story because every story is about relationships. <laughs> so that was kind of a loophole. I don't think many people realize that loophole in the submission thing. So um, this is called The Sufferance. The thing I hate most about visiting Eric is rubbing ointment into his scalp to treat the fungus infection. The entire top of his head looks like evil honeycomb. I think of bees flying in and out of the cavities of his skull, feeding hungry larvae. He wakes up and lets out a moan, his solitary lung rendering it mercifully hushed. He freezes me with a stare. My brother, the 12-year-old monster. I stare back, I've gotten used to this. It's only one eye, after all. What's going on in his head? What new ailment is he dreaming up to infect himself with next? I break the stair and begin picking up the get well cards that have fallen over. Each of Eric's organs sits in its own plastic box and I've arranged his cards on these to brighten the place up. An atrophied lung lends a great deal of pathos to the generic message sitting above it. Every piece of Eric has at least one card cheering it on. We haven't received any cards in a while though. Not since people found out it was the sufferance. I first saw the sufferance reflected in my sister's face as he wa she watched Eric twist his right eye in its socket, apparently trying to snap the nerve attaching it to his brain. We were at the dinner table, and when I turned to see the source of her horror, Eric's left eye was in deep concentration, an astronomer viewing a particularly interesting star, while his other eye spun frantically. My mother, who was painting in the next room, rushed in and banged on the table, bringing him back from his meditation. The next morning, conjunctivitis had sealed the eye closed. Mother reopened it with warm water, but by lunchtime it was cemented shut again. At this point, Eric must have realised what a talent he'd developed. A nurse I've never seen before comes in to check his temperature. I wonder what exactly she's taking the temperature of. 
the greater part of his body is being run artificially, so surely the doctors can regulate its temperature. It must be for appearance sake, to make Eric feel he's still human. Eric refutes this with a bark. The nurse and I exchange the hospital smile. She's doing marvelous work, whereas I'm staying strong, the saint and the stoic. Her name is Diane, she's beautiful. I break the ice with a joke about hospital food and she laughs. I tell her she has a beautiful laugh and she tells me her favorite thing in the world is laughter. I love laughing too, I say. She tells me there's a Woody Allen season starting at the Film Institute next week and we arrange to see a film together. Our date goes amazingly and the next week we go for dinner and end up back at my place. Things move fast, we're in love, we book a holiday to Paris. We arrive at the airport and find our check-in desk. We're early so there's no queue. We approach the desk and hand over our passports. The lady asks us, do we have any luggage to check in? And I say yes. I start to take Eric off the trolley. <laughs> one by one, his organs are labelled and taken off by the conveyor. I watch them disappear behind the plastic curtains. When I've emptied the trolley, I realise I've left his head at home. We're going to have to go back. I turn to Diane. She doesn't look happy. The sound of piss trickling into Eric's pouch wakes me from my dream. It's dark and he's fast asleep. I throw on my shoes, walk home and fall into bed. Some people think the worst place for someone with the sufferance is a hospital, but after inflicting a few minor ailments on themselves, the sufferer will usually arrive at one that will land them there. Once admitted, the sufferer's real work can begin. Without the distractions of everyday life, he can concentrate wholeheartedly on picking himself apart from the inside. Eric's Trojan horse was a gastric ulcer he'd lovingly crafted overnight, which doubled him up in agony by the morning. After he was rushed to hospital and the doctor had a good look with the endoscope, he was put on a course of drugs to reduce the acid in his stomach. They kept him in for observation. This was when Eric really started to have fun. He blew up his appendix like a balloon at a child's party and sulked for a week when it was removed. He clenched his kidneys and produced stones the way a magician might clench a fist and produce a dove. His long blonde locks fell out and blew around the, war, the ward for weeks like silly string. He played eeny, meeny, miny, mo with fungal diseases before settling on the black crown of Favus he now wears with pride. The doctors thought it best if Eric were moved to his own room, a private chamber for the child king of dysfunction. Father Daly is in Eric's room the next day when I arrive. He's holding his rosary beads, mumbling prayers and staring grimly at the bed where Eric lies opened like an overcoat on an unexpectedly sunny day. Never mind that, Father, give us the hard stuff. How about an exorcism? Summon the offending spirit and ask him politely in the name of Jesus to leave. Last rites again, Father, how many times is that now? Third time lucky? He turns around. Ah, young man, I hoped I'd see you here. Well, who else? I was very sad to hear about your mother, great woman. Technically, she should be on his shit list he being a Catholic and she being a suicide, but I, I let it go. <laughs> Thank you, Father. And your sister, what, what, what's her name? Sally, yes, Sally. Where's she now? Gone traveling, Father, the day after the funeral, in fact. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Lao, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> Detecting bitterness, he's lost for words. Usually you can fall back on phrases like families are a great strength at times like these, but our short conversation has proved quite the opposite in my case. The one in a million family that crumbles in the face of adversity. Forgiveness is a great gift, he says, holding out his hand to me. I'm going to watch some telly, I say, and slipping, slip his grasp and escape into the corridor. The day room has been taken over by a freshly breathed family, so I can't watch television. Grief is like a sixth sense, overriding all other senses. Like rapture. I'm standing at the door looking right at them, but they don't see me. The phantom at the funeral. It's the family of the man across the hall from Eric. Lung cancer. His children all seem young enough. Still teenagers, I'd say. Everyone looks numb, in shock, eating sandwiches, drinking tea. Everyone except the man's wife. She looks like she's been crying for a week. Her face looks like it was made for nothing else. Grieving is a pro process, an exchange of chemicals in the brain. This could take some time. Going back to Eric's room, I find Father Daly gone. I go out to get some air, but end up walking along the beach. Rain comes in 10 minute bursts with scorching sun in between and I stroll home with the beginnings of a fever and go to bed. I dream of being eaten by a creature so massive that its open mouth blocks out the sun. The phone wakes me up at four o'clock. It's Dr. Finley. 
he tells me not to panic but he needs to ask me for permission to switch off eric's ventilator when the time comes i tell him i'll sign whatever he needs and hang up but then stay awake until daybreak wondering whether i sounded too eager doctors say that the sufferance is the hardest illness to treat because there's no definite locus for it one day you could be treating gallstones the next day a stroke the amount of specialists involved in a sufferance case means the public health service won't have anything to do with the treatment of it it's in holes like these that inheritances disappear the practice of splitting the patient into pieces is relatively new each organ is sundered and boxed off and all somatic functions are artificially replicated it makes everything less complicated for the doctors as drastic changes can often be seen with the naked eye if they need to administer a drug they can bypass the digestive and nervous system altogether introducing it directly into the organ when it's needed more importantly it's useful in regulating messages sent by the brain so eric went into the operating theater a cadaver and came out a cipher a psychedelic jigsaw puzzle it was a shock to see him sprawl there each box of a sinister incubator cradling a mangled offspring oh eric you've been pompadoured said my compassionate artist mother <laughs> returning from a trip to pa from paris and very kindly giving her son half an hour of her time very efficient use of space <laughs> so what could eric do now he'd been expelled from the playroom his brain's perverse his brain's perverse transmissions being stopped just out of his chin like a great virtuoso eric made do with the limited palate of his head and went through something of a minimalist phase with great care he cultivated polyps in the mucous membranes of his nose and ears the doctor checks these every day to see if they've grown or turned malignant sometimes he lets out a sigh as he looks through the horoscope and i haven't decided whether this is a sigh of despair or wonderment after all where where would a doctor get a chance to view this many facets of the morbid anatomy in the one bed today it looks like eric will finally achieve his goal as surely as a baby tooth slices through a baby's gum eric will die his much cherished growths finally turning delinquent and accelerating their advance on his brain dr findlay asked me to wait outside i need to do my final examination he says ushering me out of the room his bree breezy manner making it sound like eric's knowledge is being tested at the end of a hard term study there are six checks the doctor doctor must make to confirm legal death has occurred the doctor reappears after 10 minutes and tells me that eric has passed well done eric i start to tell the doctor that i'd like eric's organs to be donated to people in need of them but i stop myself it's seeming obvious that none of them would be of use to anyone when eric left he scorched the earth the doctor switches it off father daly comes in and stares at the vessel he believes a moment ago contained eric's soul i imagine his almighty as a street fraudster playing the shell and pea game with the bits of eric and his soul is it in the liver father no try again is it in the spleen now oh hard luck try again <laughs> father daly pays the deceiver by handing over days of his life and with sleight of hand the deceiver sucks him dry i get the urge to laugh hysterically and have to leave the room i go to the day room and slump into an armchair I wonder if they're making my sandwiches. How many will I get? Will it be a reduced amount considering I'm the only family here? Mm. <laughs> Eric was a selfish prick, ripping himself apart and not caring about anyone around him. Mother threw herself off the pier rather than face it, and then Sally just ran. She's still completely oblivious to the fact that Eric is dead. She'll probably check her emails in a few days in an internet cafe in Bangkok or Saigon, sending back a touching inquiry about the funeral arrangements. I'm going to dump in the, in the back garden and let the rats have them. Where's this bile coming from? I look down at my hands, the pigment of my skin looks strange. At fa first I think it's the light in here, but it's still bright and all the lights are switched off. My skin has turned a dirty yellow like cold tea or smoker's fingers. I run to the bathroom and look in the mirror. The whites of my eyes, I'm yellow all over. A vivid memory of my father comes into my head from when I was eight years old. This is jaundice. No, this is the sufferance, a disease born from a notion in your head. In a beautiful symmetry, the carer becomes the sufferer, layer by layer, stripped of empathy as the sufferance burrows itself beneath. I no, no longer see myself as a coherent being, but as an assemblage of sentient spare parts. My nervous system heaves like a tropical forest, loathing itself. Insects fire off hateful signals as my body debates its downfall. My tongue long, longs to be swallowed, my eyes yearn to stare into the sun and burn themselves out like spent fuses. Intoxicated with potential, I lie on the floor and concentrate. Thank you.
hauntingly erotic. Very good. <laughs> Frighteningly erotic. Yeah, I was actually disturbed how I found that quite erotic. Did anyone else find that? Yeah, it's really erotic. Erotic. <laughs>